She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. The case we are looking into today actually started unfolding last April in Miami, Florida with the death of 27-year-old Christian Obumselli at the hands of his girlfriend, 26-year-old Courtney Clenny. Now, she claims that she stabbed him in self-defense, but Christian's family and the district attorney of Miami-Dade County, which I actually think they're called state's attorneys, not district attorneys in Florida, but the state's attorney of Miami-Dade County, she also seems to believe that Christian's death was the culmination of a tempestuous and combative relationship that began in November of 2020, a relationship in which Courtney Clenny was the main aggressor. There's a lot to talk about today. I've got the facts. I've got the evidence. I've got some opinions. Okay, so we're going to get into all of it. But before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV. If you're like me and you love documentaries the way I do, you probably have already exhausted most of your documentary options on streaming platforms. Maybe you've even watched some of them twice. And that's why you should try Magellan TV, a documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers. Magellan TV has more true crime documentaries than any other platform. And every week, they add 15 to 20 hours of new content so you will never run out of something to watch. And I'm very happy to announce that a new season of one of my favorite true crime series that's on Magellan TV recently dropped, Murder Maps. There's already two seasons and the third one just came out. Murder Maps explores notorious homicides in modern history and every episode focuses on a different period within the London area. Season three has an episode on the acid bath murderer John George Hay and the they have an episode on Ruth Ellis, who was a nightclub manager. She confessed to murdering her abusive partner, and she would eventually go on to become the last woman to be executed in Britain. Murder Maps is such a good series, and now there are three full seasons of riveting episodes to watch, combining two of my favorite things, true crime and history. So if you have Magellan TV already, I highly suggest you check it out. And for those of you who don't have Magellan TV yet, you can click the link in the description box and try it out for free for one month, totally free. Magellan TV is completely ad-free. It can be watched anytime, anywhere on your television, cell phone, tablet, or laptop. It's also compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. And they don't just have true crime content. They have amazing history, science, nature, and travel documentaries that will keep you entertained and educated for hours. With an annual membership of just $59.98 a year, you only pay $4.99 a month for 3,500 hours worth of amazing documentaries. But once again, if you click the link in the description box and use that link to sign up for Magellan TV, you can enjoy all that Magellan TV has to offer for one month totally free. So you can see if you like it, try it out, see what they have to offer. There's no strings attached. You can cancel anytime, but I really don't think you're going to want to. Thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video and let's dive back in. So it took me a while to kind of figure out how I was going to format this video because there was so much information. Um, and there was a lot of information that it was like, is this relevant to the case? I don't know, but it's definitely relevant to me forming my opinion as to what happened and how I feel about it. And I will say, you know, cases like this involving intimate partner violence, involving domestic violence, they're always a little tough for me because I was a victim of domestic violence. I was abused in a previous relationship. And so I, I think I tend to 
be biased about that. I mean, I'm just going to admit it. Like, I tend to sometimes be biased because of my own personal experiences. And I think that happens to all of us, right? Our perspective is shaped on what we've seen, what we've experienced, what we know, what's happened to us. But I try very, very hard in these cases to to try to not take sides and try to not like jump to conclusions. And I try also to understand that just because I'm a woman who was abused in a past relationship, it doesn't mean that only women are abused in relationships. We know that men can be abused in relationships too. So I have to keep an open mind going forward into this. So I'll just get that out of the way. I'm going to try very hard to to keep my own personal biases in check and look at this as fairly as possible. I want to do that. And like I said, difficult to understand how to format this because you'll see what I mean, but when a case like this happens and a person is involved that has some sort of public notoriety, it just it spins out of control and it becomes about all these extraneous variables. And I didn't want it to become about all these extraneous variables, but I will say that some of these extraneous variables, I believe, are relevant in in some way to understanding maybe what happened here. And before we go any further, I do have to state the obvious. The one thing about Courtney Clenny that has been inserted into every headline about this tragic case. Courtney is an OnlyFans model and an influencer. She has, I, I think, roughly over 2 million followers on Instagram under the name Courtney Taylor. I'm not sure how many people she had following her on OnlyFans, but she definitely seemed to be doing well financially. At least that's what she suggested when she was a guest on a Miami-based podcast called the We in Miami podcast. And Courtney was on that podcast about five months ago. So she was on that podcast about a month before her boyfriend, Christian, was stabbed to death by her. She was on that podcast with a couple other uh, ladies who also do, you know, OnlyFans and, and work similar to that. And they were all kind of saying, like, how much money they make doing it. And personally, to me, it seems like Courtney was actually doing really well with OnlyFans, really well financially. She did use her Instagram page to advertise her OnlyFans content. And based on her Instagram following, she was probably a high earner on the OnlyFans platform, which means she could have been making upwards of six figures a month easily. She probably was. Bella Thorne makes something like $2 million a month on OnlyFans. That Catch Me Outside girl, uh, she makes like a million dollars a month on OnlyFans. I'm not saying Courtney is at that level, but Courtney is objectively beautiful. She's a very nice figure. And that's probably because she started out on social media years ago as a fitness influencer. And I looked her up on YouTube. She still has videos up on her YouTube channel from six years ago where she is much younger and she's giving tips for working out and eating healthy. Now, do I think that Courtney being an OnlyFans model is relevant to this case? Well, that depends. I think the fact that she was an OnlyFans model was like a good clickbaity thing for the mainstream media. It reminds me a lot of, you know, Alexis Sharkey and even Gabby Petito, where the headlines made sure to mention their alleged influencer status. However, in this case, in this specific situation, I think it may actually be relevant. And I'll talk about that in a little bit my opinion on it. The fight that ended with Christian Obumseli losing his life, it started on April 3rd at the One Parizo luxury apartment building in Miami's Edgewater neighborhood. It's hard to piece together what exactly their relationship status was at the point that this fight went down. News reports have claimed that Courtney and Christian shared the apartment located at 3131 Northeast 7th Avenue in Miami, Florida. But Courtney's lawyer, Frank Prito, he's claimed that the two were actually not together at the time of the fight and Christian's stabbing. And Preto also alleges that Christian was stalking Courtney for several weeks and he was not residing in that apartment with her at that point. And Christian had committed a forcible felony entering the apartment without Courtney's permission on April 3rd and several times in the days leading up to April 3rd. Now, we do know that Courtney and Christian had lived together in Austin, Texas before moving. They both moved together to Miami at the end of 2021. Now, when Courtney talked about her move to Florida on her OnlyFans profile, she made no mention of having a boyfriend. She just said, quote, proud Texan, 
full-time fitness model and foodie living with my two dogs, Jesse and Ranger. I just moved to Miami, so I need your positive vibes. Scary big change for this little Texas girl, end quote. Even though that doesn't really make sense because Courtney had left Texas previously and she had lived in L.A. for for a while. I think when she was making her YouTube video six years ago, she was living in L.A. because she mentioned going to school in California. I would also suggest that Austin is quite a big city, you know, quite an active city, a young city where a lot of young people hang out and there's a lot of partying going on. So I would say there's quite a bit of similarities between L.A., Austin, and Miami. But, you know, she's just a little Texas girl (laughs) trying to make it in the big city. At the end of the day, though, it does look like both Courtney and Christian did occupy this Miami apartment together, at least for the majority of their time in Florida, because the police were called there several times to address domestic disputes. Now, prosecutors have claimed that Courtney kicked Christian out in late March, but they rekindled their relationship on April 1st. Christian had moved back in, and then arguments between them started immediately. With police responding to the apartment, Police reported that Clenny appeared intoxicated when she was contacted on the evening of April 1st, 2022. This was two days before the homicide. On Sunday, April 3rd, 2022, the day of Christian's death, events started peacefully with the couple filming themselves with their dogs in the apartment. A key fob for the records show that Christian left the apartment at 1.15 p.m. and returned about three hours later at 4.32 p.m. with sandwiches that he had bought for both of them. So what we've done here now, if you look at the screens, um, you'll see there a timeline. Um, While you look at it, I'm gonna try to go through it because the timing is is very important to understand in this case. So at 4.01, Clenny called Christian. Then she goes live on Instagram. And then at 4.33 p.m., she called him again, shortly after posting the video. At 4.33 p.m., Christian walks into the apartment. Okay, so that's kind of the timeline we're hearing from the Miami-Dade County State's Attorney. Christian comes home with the sandwiches, and then within less than 30 minutes, Courtney's on the phone with 911 at 4.57 p.m. reporting that her boyfriend had been stabbed. During the short time period after Christian returned to the apartment and the 911 call from Courtney was made, other residents of the building had also made complaints to the apartment security about hearing fights and noises coming from Courtney's apartment, and security had reportedly also made a call to the police at 4.46 p.m. Catherine Fernandez Rundle, the state attorney for Miami-Dade County, she reported that during the 911 call, Christian could be heard saying he was dying and he was losing feeling in his arm, and Courtney could be heard saying, quote, I am so sorry. End quote. Christian stabbing must have occurred between 4.33 p.m. when he returned to the apartment with those sandwiches and at 4.57 p.m. when the defendant, Clenny, called 9-11. When the police arrived, Courtney was cradling Christian's body. She was wearing only a black bra and sweatpants, and she was covered in blood. It also turns out that Courtney was likely on the phone with her mother at the time of the incident. According to phone records, Courtney had called her mother at 4.43 p.m., and this call lasted six minutes. And then there was another call to Courtney's mother from Courtney's phone at 4.49 p.m., and this call lasted for seven minutes. In a recorded telephone statement to the police, Courtney's mother alleged that she'd heard her daughter tell Christian to leave the apartment and that Courtney had made statements that Christian was lying about something. There also appears to be a text to Courtney from her mother at 5.25 p.m., and in this text, Courtney's mom allegedly mentions the topic of self-defense and advises her daughter to not speak to the police without an attorney. Now, Courtney initially admitted to the police that she had stabbed her boyfriend boyfriend, but she had done so in self-defense. She said that Christian had shoved her and grabbed her by the throat and pushed her against a wall. She'd managed to get away. She ran into the kitchen where she grabbed a knife and threw it at him from 10 feet away. 
However, after the autopsy, prosecutors claim that Christian's injury was too severe to have been inflicted by a knife thrown from a distance. According to the medical examiner, Christian's one wound was more consistent with a powerful and downward knife thrust, which had gone three inches into his chest and sliced an important artery near his heart. Christian Obamselli was rushed to the hospital where he died from his wound shortly after, and Courtney was Baker Acted after she made statements to the police about wanting to hurt herself. Now, the Baker Act in Florida, this allows mental health doctors, judges, and law enforcement to commit a person to a mental health treatment facility for up to 72 hours with the intention of evaluation happening, where it would then be determined whether this person was a risk to themselves or others. After the 72-hour hold, Courtney Clenny was not arrested or charged for the murder of her boyfriend, although the investigation was supposedly still active and open. And Courtney's lawyer, Frank Preto, as well as the Obamselli family, along with the lawyer they had hired, Larry Hanfield, everyone was speaking to the media, giving their own takes on what that meant and how they planned to move forward. Detectives and myself thought it was best to have her Baker acted that evening, um, and we've had an open line of communication. And uh, we've offered to, uh, to sit down with them and provide any additional assistance that they may want uh, to close their investigation. And the attorney representing Courtney Claney says Courtney kicked Christian Abunseli out of the apartment she was renting in Edgewater a week before the deadly stabbing because of domestic abuse allegations. Now, her attorney says those allegations against Abunseli is what led to the deadly stabbing. But Clenny's attorney, Frank Prado, says people are pointing fingers without knowing all of the facts. He says despite the national attention this case is gaining, his client is innocent. In today's uh, climate, um, what somebody says automatically becomes a fact. We need to get back to understanding, wait for the facts to come out. All they're looking for is justice. We know the suspect uh, that was involved in this incident has not been arrested. Uh, I'm confident having had a meeting with the state attorney's office uh, that uh, they were very attentive. They answered all the necessary questions. Abu Maselli's brother says he wants to see an arrest. I do believe she is a killer, the killer, and she does need to be arrested. So, in response to Frank Prito's claims that Christian was asked to leave and he shouldn't have been there, I believe that Christian and Courtney probably did get in a fight and they probably did break up, and he probably did move out in late March. But it does appear that they rekindled their relationship on April 1st. They recorded an Instagram video together on the morning of April 3rd. He went out and, and brought sandwiches back for the two of them. Now, is it possible that Christian and Courtney got in a fight on April 3rd, sometime before 1 p.m., and when he left the apartment that day, they were fighting and mad at each other? Yes, that's possible. And it's also possible that when he returned three hours later with sandwiches, it was almost like a peace offering, you know, because if you were just running out to get lunch and if you were just running out to get sandwiches, it wouldn't have taken you three hours. So they may have gotten in a fight. He might have been like, okay, I'm leaving. I'll give you your space or I'm leaving. I'm mad at you. He left. And then after a couple hours of just wandering around or doing his thing, he was like, I feel bad. Let me grab some sandwiches and bring them home kind of like saying, hey, I'm sorry, here's a sandwich. I know you're probably hungry. But when he got home with the sandwiches, Courtney was still upset. Is that possible? Yes. However, I do not think that it's fair to act as if Courtney didn't want Christian there at all. And I don't think it's fair to act as if she had made that clear and they weren't even together because that's not the situation here, in my opinion, as according to the state's attorney, Christian and Courtney were together that morning on April 3rd. They made an Instagram video together. They seemed to be getting along early in the morning. Now, in the days and weeks after Christian's death, Courtney Clenny did some things that raised a few eyebrows. It was reported that the day after Christian died, Courtney posted some X-rated material on OnlyFans. However, I will say it's not clear whether that content was scheduled to be posted at that time or if she posted it in real time. So, for example, sometimes content creators, especially people who do short form content on like TikTok or OnlyFans or things like that, they'll batch record a bunch of stuff and then just schedule that stuff to go up. So they'll spend like one day, five hours recording a bunch of shorter videos, a bunch of shorter content, and then they will just post that stuff or schedule that stuff to be posted 
throughout the week. So basically they work like one day and then boom, boom, schedule that content throughout the week and they're done. It sounds awesome, honestly. So it's not clear whether that's what happened here, whether Courtney batch recorded at some point and then just scheduled stuff to go up throughout the week, which would mean, you know, she's not thinking like, oh, I scheduled content to go out on OnlyFans. I better cancel that because I just stabbed my boyfriend. If she did post it in real time, like if she stabbed her boyfriend one day and then the next day she was, you know, getting sexy on OnlyFans, yeah. That's 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 odd, right? That's that's not normal, I don't think. But I don't know. You guys let me know what you think. I feel like there has to be some sort of like grace period, you know, after the death of your boyfriend, especially if you're the one who who stabbed your boyfriend and caused his death. I feel like there has to be like a, a chunk of time where, you know, maybe you don't post on your OnlyFans. Maybe like a 72-hour period. But I will say throughout the investigation, into Christian Obumselli's death, Courtney did continue to post content on OnlyFans. Additionally, Courtney was seen in the bar of Miami's Grand Beach Hotel on April 8th, having a drink with her father just five, five days after she stabbed her boyfriend to death, the third to the eighth, five days, five days, not even a full week. She was confronted there by another customer and Courtney and her father ended up leaving the bar. His brother. Yeah, and are seeking justice. Yeah, what? let's all videotape her. Okay. Right now, she, yeah, you she should go. go. Yeah, you should go. Because you just know my boyfriend. Yeah, you did. Yeah, and yeah. He's right to Yeah, okay, cool. So I don't know if you could hear the last thing that Courtney said in that clip because she's further away. She's like walking out of the hotel, so it's kind of um, muffled. But she says, he tried to kill me. And a lot of people thought that it was a little insensitive of Courtney to be out at a bar less than a week after her boyfriend died. I mean, less than a week after he died because she stabbed him. And she was having a drink with her dad in full hair and makeup. I guess that's what people said, full hair and makeup. I think she had like a baseball cap on, if I remember correctly from the clip. I wouldn't say full hair and makeup, but I will say she definitely didn't just roll out of bed. And if she did roll out of bed looking like that. She is a very blessed woman. But a lot of people had a problem with it. I guess they thought she should look like disheveled or tired or more depressed or be wearing like black from head to toe or not have the balls to show her face in public. And her lawyer, Frank Prito, responded by saying, quote, Courtney was there that night with her father, who simply wanted to pop in and have a drink in private, which was disrupted by this woman who started filming, end quote. I don't know, man. I see it both ways. I'm trying, I'm really trying hard to remain unbiased. Um, and in this situation, I definitely suppose I could see it both ways. Courtney's lawyer was doing the most to make it seem like his client was just crushed under the weight of what had happened and she was suffering from PTSD and she was struggling mentally and emotionally. You know, she had to be Baker acted. So if that was the narrative that Courtney and her lawyer wanted to present, Hanging out at a bar and getting some drinks probably isn't the best way to do that. Now, if Courtney and her father wanted to have a drink in private, as Frank Prito claimed, why didn't they do it in a private place like her apartment maybe or maybe they get a room at that hotel and have a drink there where they can be in solitude and not be harassed by other people and have privacy and talk about things and you know she can cry if she has to and she can be emotional if she has to and she doesn't have to worry about people looking at her and judging her. Now since Courtney's dad is from Texas he most likely had a hotel room in Miami or he was staying with her somewhere because I feel like five days after this stabbing in her apartment. Is the apartment still a crime scene? Is she not allowed to go back in yet? Is she allowed to go back into the apartment? Was her father staying with her in her apartment? Was he staying at this hotel that they were seen in the bar in? So I guess like what I'm trying to say is if they wanted to have a drink in private, there was probably a multitude of other places that they could have done that. But on the other hand, it's always tough to judge someone on how they act in the wake of a tragedy. There isn't a standard cookie cutter way that someone should behave or look or feel when they've experienced something scary or sad or traumatic. 
So maybe Courtney just wanted to get some air, you know, get some different scenery. Maybe staying in her apartment all day and night was driving her crazy. She just wanted to get out. She was Baker Acted, so she was held in a mental health institution for 72 hours, meaning that she had probably just gotten out of the mental health institution. And so maybe she just wanted to, like, get out and see people and kind of... I don't know, feel normal for a minute. Maybe she didn't want to be in her apartment because that was the place where Christian had died. I don't know. I personally would have made a different choice. I personally don't think I would have been meeting my father or anyone out at a bar five days after I stabbed my boyfriend and he died. And it's a very public like news story at this point, especially considering that, you know, she was a well-known person. She's a public figure, et cetera, et cetera. People are going to see her. It's almost as if she was asking for that. So I probably would have made a different choice and not done that. But also at the same time, my initial instinct is to judge her for doing that. And I, I'm trying not to judge her for doing that, I guess. You know what I mean? So after pressure from the family of Christian Obamselli, Courtney Clenny was finally arrested and charged with second-degree murder on August 10th in Hawaii, where she was reportedly in treatment for substance abuse issues and PTSD. And a lot of people have spoken up in the wake of all of this happening, Christian's death, Courtney's arrest. And these people have painted a picture of a relationship that has pretty much been plagued by violence and arguments and toxicity from day one. So remember, before Christian and Courtney lived in Miami, they had lived in South Austin, and this young man, Aiden Nesvisky, he lived near them in South Austin. He lived in the same apartment building, and he'd even gone to a music festival with them once. He said that the police were called to the couple's apartment more than once, and Aiden said that their fights would get so bad that they would sometimes spill over into his apartment, and he cited a specific example of one time when I guess they were fighting and a tiger painting was thrown from Courtney and Christian's apartment and actually landed on Aiden's 10th floor balcony, a tiger painting. Somebody threw the tiger painting out the window. That's what I, I need everyone to realize. Was the tiger painting important to the fight, to the argument? What does the tiger painting have to do with anything? Was it just the closest thing that could be grabbed and thrown? That can't possibly be. Why would you throw anything off the balcony of your apartment building, much less a tiger painting? That's dangerous, okay? Maybe they thought that the painting was the least dangerous thing to throw because if it gets thrown off the balcony and it makes it all the way to the ground, at least it's not going to hit somebody. Or if it does hit somebody, at least it'll, you know, maybe the person's head will just go through the painting, like in those old, like, vaudeville acts. But I can't imagine um, being in an apartment building and hearing this couple constantly fighting and then one day, like, a tiger painting just, like, crashes onto your balcony from their fight. It's ludicrous to me. So Aiden Nevesky said, quote, Behind closed doors, we just started hearing some shouting, yelling. We don't know who was starting what. We didn't get a lot of context. Occasionally, we would hear some glasses break and some banging on the walls, the floor. Not sure who was doing it. End quote. However, the friends of the couple believe that Courtney Clenny was the main aggressor in the relationship. They portray a very violent relationship at the hands of only one person. I've seen her hit him. I've never seen him hit her. From what we've personally experienced between the both of them, we believe that like Christian wouldn't put her in a position where she would need to stab him to protect herself. But a neighbor of Courtney's in Miami had seen an incident just the week before Christian's death that led him to believe Christian was the main aggressor. One neighbor who tells me that he has a very clear view of the couple's apartment said a week before the stabbing, things were off and that Clenny was the one getting physically abused. I could not tell if it was open-handed or close-handed but he was swinging at her. Police say in the past three months, they've responded to multiple disturbance calls at the couple's apartment. Their mutual friends are still trying to process what went wrong. Now, I just want to say that I appreciate uh, Courtney and Christian's friends coming forward. I appreciate the neighbor coming forward. Like, the more information we have, the more context we have, that's great. However, none of these people know what they're talking about. Um, if you've been in an abusive relationship, you'll know what I mean. 
if you know people who have been in an abusive relationship, you'll know what I mean. You never get the full story being outside the relationship. You are never really allowed to look behind closed doors. You don't really know what their dynamic is. You know what their dynamic is in front of you. You know what their dynamic is when they're in a group. You know what their dynamic is when they know people are watching and they know other people are around. But you don't really know what their dynamic is behind closed doors. So I think that it's important. It does add some context. It does give us a little insight into what Courtney and Christian were like around their friends, but it doesn't give us the full picture. And let's recap a little bit. We have the police responding to domestic issues when Courtney and Christian lived in Austin. We have the police responding again when Courtney and Christian lived in Florida. And it looks like the police responded to a noise complaint or domestic dispute on April 1st, just two days before Christian's murder. And at that time, it was reported that Courtney was intoxicated. Now, I get the impression that Courtney Clenny was intoxicated quite a bit. And I got that impression from her before I even knew about past legal trouble she'd been in. I got this impression from just seeing videos of her, hearing her talk, um, seeing things she's posted. It seems like alcohol was a big part of her life. And, and then we found out that on September 16th, 2020, Courtney Clenny was arrested in Austin, Texas for driving under the influence. She was scheduled for a pretrial conference on June 15th. Bond from that charge was set at 8,000, and she was forced to install a locking device on her car, which would measure her blood alcohol level. It also looks like Courtney was in a car crash in Texas in 2018, and court documents show that she was being sued by a Texas woman and accused of causing personal injury, property damage, and vehicle loss following this car crash. But the plaintiff dismissed the suit after the incident was settled out of court. So Courtney's got some some issues here. She's got some substance abuse issues for sure. And as we sort of touched on in the last video, in the last Coffee and Crime Time, alcohol is great for so many things, right? A drink here, a drink there, a nice social lubricant. It helps you relax a little bit. I'm a big fan. But, but too much alcohol is usually always a recipe for disaster. I'll, I'll say usually always because, of course, there's the exception to every rule. <laughs> Just like there was the exception to every rule in the last video when I said I don't believe in love at first sight and I don't believe that, you know, you can meet somebody after two weeks and fall in love with them and have a successful marriage forever and ever. But of course, there's the exception to the rule. And then everybody was like, I can't believe you said that because <laughs> they just completely missed the part where I said, of course, there's an exception to every rule. And now there's going to be people in the comment section of this video being like, what are you talking about? I can drink two bottles of Grey Goose a night and have the best time. There's an exception to every rule. In my experience, too much alcohol is never a good thing, especially when you're in a relationship and this relationship has some unresolved issues. If you're both drinking, those unresolved issues come to the surface real quick and the alcohol is like, hey, while we're here, let's resolve these. But you're not logically right. You're not like using, you know, good decision making and good cognitive processing because you're drunk. So it never just turns out well. Like you try to bring those unresolved issues out and you think like, oh, we're going to solve this now. We're sitting here. We're talking. We're having a great time. I'm just going to pull this little gem out from two weeks ago and my partner is going to be completely OK with it and we are going to solve this tonight. And it doesn't ever end like that. It usually ends with somebody crying, somebody storming out, you know, yelling, things getting thrown, and sometimes violence. So I'll just say alcohol, bad news bears. So we have all these reports coming out of Courtney and Christian fighting, and then the video footage started to come out, and most of it was released by the Miami-Dade Prosecutor's Office. Both of these clips I'm going to play to you are from February. Now, I don't know if they happened on the same night or if they're just signs of rising tensions in the relationship that month. It was shocking because, you know, a lot of couples argue, a lot of couples do things and get into it, but not physical like that. That was Plenty's former neighbor speaking exclusively to NBC6. He says he took this video in February, two months before the fatal stabbing. The video doesn't have audio, but the neighbor says he heard the couple from the 12th floor. We just started hearing them arguing. And he started eating real quick and, you know, she was being a little aggressive, trying to jump in the water. A newly released video allegedly shows OnlyFans model Courtney Clenny attacking her boyfriend Christian Obamselli in an elevator on February 21st. The video allegedly shows Clenny repeatedly pushing her boyfriend and trying to pull his hair. The man identified as Obamselli appears to push her back in an apparent attempt to block her attacks. 
So Courtney's lawyer had a problem with this elevator video being released, and he said, quote, It's a shame that the state's attorney's office is seeking to win this case in the court of public opinion by showing an irrelevant and likely inadmissible video of Courtney in an elevator getting physical with Obamselli. The video does not depict the events leading up to what was captured in the elevator. Obam Selly was the abuser, the worst kind of abuser. He would manipulate and abuse Courtney in private when he thought nobody was around. Do not forget, the initial investigation from the City of Miami Police Department uncovered an independent witness who saw Obam Selly hitting Courtney in the head while he thought he was in the privacy of Courtney's apartment. Nobody has ever denied that Courtney and her abuser had a tumultuous relationship. It is inappropriate for prosecutors to try and taint the community against Courtney to the point where she may not be able to receive a fair trial. The charging decision in this matter should have been made on the evidence of what occurred that evening in the apartment and nothing more. This is a case of self-defense, and the facts that will be presented at trial will prove this. Also, the arrest warrant issued in this matter contains deceptive and incomplete statements, clearly an effort to justify a finding of probable cause when presented to the magistrate. Further, the medical examiner has formulated conclusory opinions that will not stand up to scientific scrutiny. Unfortunately, it appears that the prosecutors have taken the easy way out by charging Courtney, effectively placing the decision to clear Courtney of these charges in the hands of the judge and jury. We are confident she will be exonerated and Courtney will be seen for what she is, a victim of domestic abuse that survived her abuser, end quote. Sorry, I got a little dramatic there towards the end, but it felt like a monologue that really called for a dramatic reading. And I'm going to withhold my comments about all of this until I'm done telling you all the facts. But I do have things that I want to say, and I I keep wanting to say them. So don't forget, but bear with me, because this elevator video, I have a lot of things to say about it. A former cop turned OnlyFans model named Christian Zendegas gave her opinion that the footage of Courtney and Christian in the elevator was damning. And she said, quote, I think if they didn't have that elevator video, she might have a fighting chance on self-defense, end quote. She also acknowledged that both Christian and Courtney could have been abusive in the relationship, but the video makes it appear as if Courtney is the primary aggressor. She went on to say that from her experience as a police officer, these types of relationships are normal, saying, quote, I hate to say it, but it was a normal thing for us to respond to calls like that all the time. And a lot of times it was the same people, old over and over, but they're both adults too. You can't keep them away from each other unless they hurt each other, and then you try to put legal process on them, and they either stay away from each other or they don't, end quote. And this is very true. Uh, They're adults, right? So even if the police are responding 20 times to domestic abuse allegations or domestic violence calls, they can't do anything. They can suggest, hey, you guys should separate. They can even, you know, try to bring one or both to court and say, like, hey, they're abusing each other. But if they don't want to be apart, you can't keep them apart. It's a very toxic cycle. It's tough, I'm sure. I'm I'm sure it's tough for law enforcement if they continue responding to calls like this and they see that nothing's changing and these two people are still together and they kind of know, like, this isn't going to end well. But there's very little that they can do because these are adult people who have free will. So besides Courtney Clenny having history with alcohol abuse, because I also found out she apparently has an open warrant from a 2015 public intoxication case from California. Remember, I said she lived in L.A. for a bit or around uh, that time, actually. It was about six years ago. But she also seems to have a history with domestic violence. In July of 2021, Courtney was charged with domestic battery after she allegedly threw a glass at her boyfriend Christian's head. It happened on July 27th at around 5 a.m. Christian and Courtney were staying at the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas. Apparently, they'd gotten into a fight, so Christian went to sleep on the couch. He later told police that Courtney had woken him up, and she told him he could come to bed, or she asked him to come to bed, but he told her he didn't want to come to bed because he was still frustrated from the fight they'd had earlier, and this caused her to get upset. It caused them to begin fighting again, and during this fight, Courtney, I guess, picked up a glass and threw it at his head. She later told the police that this wasn't a big deal and that she threw things like glasses and plates at Christian all the time. Like, she'd thrown things at him before. But she also told the police that Christian had pushed her, grabbed her hair, and pressed his fist into her neck as if he wanted to hit her. 
A security guard at the hotel took both Christian and Courtney into custody, and according to the police report, the security guard claimed that he had held them both for possible mutual domestic battery. Courtney was charged with domestic battery, but those charges were later dropped. Courtney Clenny is currently being held at the Hawaii Correctional Facility since her August 10th arrest. She's waived extradition and she's awaiting her return to Florida. Her lawyer has been busy the past few weeks making a lot of requests, including expressing his desire to have the body of Christian Obamselli exhumed so that it can be inspected by an outside medical examiner. Now, Christian has obviously already been buried by his family. He was buried in Texas. And the family lawyer, Larry Hanfield, says the effort to get Christian exhumed is an act of desperation, and digging up Christian's body would go against his family's religious values. Unfortunately, I mean, I agree. I think it's heinous. I think it's horrendous for a family to have buried their son after he was unexpectedly killed and then to have to dig him back up. But I don't think that religious values mean much in these circumstances because Christian's family did want Courtney arrested. They wanted her arrested. They wanted her charged with murder. They were very vocal about it. And I think due to them being so vocal about it, the you know state's attorney actually moved forward and arrested her. They may not have before, but because his family was so insistent that something was going on here and that she had murdered him and that Christian didn't abuse Courtney, Courtney was arrested. So she's been arrested, she's facing charges, and now she has the right to defend herself and try to prove that she killed her boyfriend in self-defense. And one of the main points that the prosecution is going to make is that Courtney was not 10 feet away from Christian and she did not throw the knife at him. They're going to want to show that she was close to him and that she stabbed him with a great deal of force. If Courtney's trying to prove that she was 10 feet away, her lawyer is going to want to have a second look at that body, have a second medical professional, give a second opinion that supports Courtney's claims. That's just how the legal system works. That's how trials work. The defendant has a right to defend themselves in court, and to do so, they have the right to do these things, to have a second opinion on the actual wounds. So I I just don't think that religious values matter in this situation if you want actual justice because you're going to have to let Courtney and her lawyer do everything they got to do so that they can say she had a fair defense. Courtney's lawyer, Frank Prito, has also asked the judge to halt the release of evidence by the state's attorney's office until the judge inspects any evidence first. And I kind of do agree with that. As a regular person, give me all of the video footage. Give me all of the evidence. Give me everything you have. I love it. Obviously, we all want that. But as a person, if I'm Courtney and I'm being, you know, like put on trial for this and I want my shot at a fair trial, I'm probably not going to want the state's attorney's office to be releasing these things that they have, you know, deemed relevant, I guess. And I do believe the state's attorney's office released this elevator footage to show the public, like, look, she is violent. She's the one who's violent in the relationship. I will say, however, I don't necessarily believe that Courtney being violent in that clip means that she was the only one who was violent in the relationship. Okay, so here's some of my thoughts. I think it's clear that these two people had a toxic relationship. And it's very likely they both behaved badly during this relationship. And that includes being verbally, emotionally, and physically abusive. Unfortunately, I have seen these dynamics and this behavior far too many times in my life. Um, Seeing the footage of Christian going after her in the parking lot and Courtney being all dramatic and like trying to get in the water, clearly they were drinking. Seeing the elevator footage, it was all hard to watch. The elevator footage was very hard to watch. Um, I don't like seeing anybody be hit. And and some people might say like, oh, it's just a little girl hitting a guy. Like he's strong. It clearly doesn't bother him. It's like a fly buzzing around him. No, Mm-mm. I don't condone any physical aggression or, you know, physical assault in a relationship from either party. I think it's all toxic. It's all harmful. It, it completely destroys trust. It completely destroys respect for each other. It's real bad. So even if it doesn't physically hurt him, it hurts the relationship and it does hurt him in a way. Nobody should ever have to have their boundaries um, just completely devastated. Nobody should ever have to just sit there and take it and be physically assaulted by another person. It's unacceptable. Any way you cut it, no matter how you look at it. Now, do I think that either of them were beating the shit out of each other on a regular basis? No, I don't. Because At least Courtney was 
you know, on social media all the time, every day. You know, she's a, an influencer. So whether it's on OnlyFans or um, Instagram or whatever, she's on camera often. And you would see, you know, some sign of that. But like I said, for me, no amount of physical abuse is okay in a relationship. I personally don't believe that Courtney stabbed Christian in self-defense. Putting all my biases aside, putting all my personal experiences aside, I don't think that she had no other option than to stab him. I think she did it out of anger. She was probably drunk. She didn't use her head. She ended up doing something that she regretted. But it doesn't really matter if things went down the way that Courtney reported, regardless, you know? It doesn't really matter, in my opinion. She ran into another room, grabbed a knife, and threw it at Christian. The way I see it, that's not technically self-defense because she could have run out of the apartment and gotten help, or she could have gone into another room, locked the door, called someone, you know? And I'm going to get to that, calling someone, in a minute. But first, let's look at the law. To successfully claim self-defense, a defendant has to prove four elements. Courtney would have to prove that she was attacked without provocation, meaning she did not initiate the attack. But there are some exceptions to this. Courtney could have been the initial aggressor, and she could still raise a self-defense claim if Christian responded with excessive force under the circumstances or if Courtney had withdrawn from the attack and Christian had pursued her or persisted in the attack. Secondly, Courtney would have to prove that the threat of injury or death was imminent in order to prove self-defense. But that's just self-defense using non-deadly force. So, for instance, the state this happened in is Florida. In Florida, a person is justified in the use of non-deadly force in self-defense when that person reasonably believes that such conduct is necessary to defend against another person's imminent use of unlawful force. There's two statutes in Florida outlining when the use of deadly force is justified and where Courtney would possibly be able to avoid criminal liability. Under Florida's Stand Your Ground law, Courtney would be justified in using deadly force and would not have a duty to retreat if she believed that such force was necessary to prevent the imminent commission of a forcible felony or to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to herself or another person. Now, remember that term, forcible felony. We've heard it before from Courtney's lawyer, and I'm going to get back to that in a second. But this all seems pretty black and white, right? When it comes to, you know, like a criminal entering your house or apartment, obviously a criminal coming in was not invited to be there. They aren't supposed to be there. And them being there means they're probably up to no good. No one's like breaking into your apartment to, you know, have a cup of tea with you or clean your toilets. They're they're there to do something bad. So you could say under Florida's stand your ground law, if there's a criminal who enters my apartment, I don't know this person, they're a stranger, they're not meant to be here, they're up to no good, I can do whatever it takes. I can go ham on this person. There's nothing that's going to stop me. No law is going to stop me and I won't be prosecuted. But it gets a little less cut and dry when you look at the fact that there was a relationship between Courtney and Christian. They were dating. They were in a relationship. No matter what Courtney's lawyer says, according to the state's attorney and according to the evidence, Christian and Courtney were back together and had been since two days before he was stabbed. They'd spent the day of April 3rd together. He came back with sandwiches for the both of them. As far as we know, he didn't force his way into her apartment or climb into her bedroom window when she was sleeping. It seems that he was probably invited in or he walked in. And that's when Courtney was on the phone with her mom and Courtney's mom heard Courtney tell him, you know, you should leave. Now, what it seems Courtney's lawyer is doing here is taking advantage of this gray area a bit. He made a point of saying that Christian was not supposed to be at Courtney's apartment. He made a point of saying that he had committed a forcible felony, meaning like Christian had gone into the apartment when he was supposed to be there. And Courtney's lawyer also makes a point of mentioning that Christian's name was not on the lease, right? Because the presumption of reasonable fear of imminent death or great bodily harm, it does not apply if Christian had the right to be in that apartment. For example, if his name was legally on the lease or the mortgage and he lived there. Now, to be honest, I don't think that this is very fair. Uh, Christian and Courtney, they moved to Florida together. They lived in that apartment together. It may have been under Courtney's name, because she probably made more money. Now, from what I could tell, Christian was, um, I think he worked in like cryptocurrency and stuff. But let's be honest here. 
Courtney's bringing in a lot of money. There's an uneven dynamic in this relationship. Whether it's a man or a woman, when one partner is making significantly more than the other, it places tension on the relationship, it places pressure on the relationship, and it makes the partner who's bringing in less financially feel a little inadequate, especially if the partner who's bringing in more financially consistently reminds the person who's bringing in less that they're bringing in less, right? It causes a disparity. It causes a resentment between parties. So they may have signed the lease and put Courtney's name on it because she was maybe the one paying for it or maybe, you know, she had better credit. I don't know. There could be a multitude of reasons. She may have insisted upon it. You know, she may have said, like, I'm not living with you under any other circumstances. I want this to be in my name so that she could avoid any issues in the future. I'm not sure. There's tons of reasons why this might have happened. But it's not really fair if he was living there to suggest that the second she says you need to go, that he can no longer be there because he lives there, right? His stuff's all there. It's just not fair. It's like back in the day when women weren't allowed to own property, but they still lived in this home and they lived there with their husband and their children. And at any point, the husband could just be like, oh, I've found a new wife or I don't like the way you looked at that dude at the market. So you're out and you can't say anything about it. It's not fair. It's not equal. And it causes an inequality in the relationship that makes things very difficult and toxic. So as a little piece of advice, because I have been in this situation before, okay? I've been in this situation before. I literally lived with somebody for three years in an apartment. And one day they got mad at me and they said, you need to leave. And they said, you can't take this, this, and this, and this, because this is all in, in my apartment. And we bought this all when you were living in my apartment. So you basically are out on your ass with nothing but like a book bag with your toothbrush and your toothpaste and your like lotion. You know, that's all I had. Um, so I've had this happen to me before, and it's really not fair. You're at the whim of another person. It can't be a fair, healthy, equal relationship when this is going on. So as a quick tip, advice. If you're moving in with somebody, make sure your name's on the lease. Make sure your name's on the mortgage. Make sure your name is all over that bitch, okay? Because that's your house. You're going to be paying for it every month along with this other person. You're going to be paying to, you know, have it upgraded or renovated. You're going to be paying to decorate it. And at any point, your partner, who you think is great now, but could turn on a dime later, at any point, they could be like, peace, you're out, and you can't bring anything with you. So it's just, it's, to avoid issues, make sure your name is on the lease, on the mortgage, all over that bitch, okay? Man or woman, I don't care who you are, I don't care who you're dating, who you love, what you're doing, make sure you get your peace. So to be honest, it's very tough to disprove a self-defense claim, especially in a state like Florida. For instance, a recent case that was just decided on um, was that of Danielle Redlick, a woman who stabbed her husband in their kitchen during a fight, he ended up dying. He bled out on their kitchen floor. She didn't call 911 until the next morning. She tried to clean up all the blood and the mess. And this case also happened in Florida. And Derek and I actually covered it on Crime Weekly. Danielle was found not guilty of murder due to self-defense. But there was a lot more evidence in that case because, you know, Danielle and her husband, they were married. Uh, there was emails and texts and all sorts of stuff that was going back and forth between them for years. And there was enough there to convince a jury that Danielle's husband was actually abusive before the fight that ended with him getting stabbed. And the jury seemed to believe that Danielle, who claimed she was pinned up against the counter in the kitchen, who claimed she couldn't get out, who claimed that she thought if she didn't pull that knife out of that drawer and stab her husband, he was going to kill her. There was enough there that the jury believed. I mean, maybe Courtney's lawyer is feeling confident because he has text messages or things like that, which suggest Christian may have been abusive. I don't know. I think if he wants to make his case strong, he would probably need those things because to me, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. It kind of looks like she stabbed him during a fight because she was mad. She didn't think the stab was going to kill him. And then she regretted it afterwards. But I don't believe that Courtney felt there was no other way out of this situation. I don't believe that she felt that if she didn't stab Christian, he was going to kill her in that moment. She was on the phone with her mother, reportedly at the time of the stabbing. And I'm sure her mother is going to have to testify. But I can't imagine that Christian would have attempted to kill Courtney while she was on the phone with her mother, right? <laughs> so as long as she stayed on the phone and just said, hey, mom, 
you know, Christian came in. I don't want him to be here. I'm scared of him right now. He's grabbing my throat. He's grabbing me by the hair. All of this stuff would have allegedly happened when Courtney was on the phone with her mother. He's grabbing my hair. He's She's choking me. I'm going to leave the apartment. Stay on the phone with me, Mom. And if there's someone else there like Dad who has a phone, can you have him call the Miami police? Just stay on the phone with me until I'm safe. You know, she would have said that. She would have easily gotten out of the situation because I just don't see Christian or anybody being like, ah, well, I'm so mad. And I know you're on the phone with your mom, but I'm just going to go ahead and attack you anyways and, and kill you while you're on the phone with your mom. You know, technically, Courtney could have gotten out of that situation without stabbing Christian, without killing him. Therefore, to me, the self-defense claim is hard to prove because, once again, you do have to prove that you felt there was no other way out. That you felt if you did not react with this amount of force that you were going to die or you were going to be like, you know, gravely bodily injured like, I'm just going to check the timeline really quick because 59, 50, 56 to like 4, 56. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. This time period does not make sense. Okay. So there's nothing you can say with this call to her mother, these two calls with, to her mother, that something weird isn't going on here. So she was on the phone with her mother from 443 to 456. She called 911 at 457. So either... The stabbing happened while you were on the phone with your mother and you hung up to call 911 or the stabbing happened before you called your mother at 443. And then at which point we're going to sit here and assume that you talk to your mother for what? 13, 13, 14 minutes before calling 911? Like both of those things don't look good is what I'm trying to say. Either you were on the phone with your mom when you stabbed him, which means you were on the phone with your mom when you guys got in a fight, which means you could have just said to your mom, hey, mom, I'm leaving the apartment. Stay on the phone with me so nothing happens. And you could have gotten out of there because no way is Christian going to like attack you while you're on the phone with your mom or you stabbed him and then called your mom and then talked to her for like 13 minutes and then called 911 which that's not good either because he died from the stab wound. And if you had called 911 before and they'd gotten him to the hospital sooner, they may have been able to save him. So nothing looks good here for Courtney. Now, here's my personal opinion about the OnlyFans thing. And is it connected? I think it's connected. This is just my personal feeling. It takes a special sort of person to be in a relationship with somebody who performs, you know, this kind of work for a living. It takes a very secure person. It takes a person who's not prone to jealousy. It's not me, okay? It's not me. And to be fair, I don't know many men, because no offense to you guys. I love men. You guys are great. I'm not like a man hater, but I don't know many men who would be completely okay with their beautiful, sexy girlfriend posting illicit naked pictures of themselves online and just be, you know, cool and chill with that and not feel, you know, a stab of jealousy from time to time. I just don't see a lot of men because men are possessive. Men want their women to be their woman. And like posting pictures on Instagram in a bikini is one thing, but, you know, posting pictures on OnlyFans is another. I just find it would be very difficult to be in a relationship with somebody like that. Additionally, I can understand why these fights might have happened because I did watch Courtney's episode on the We in Miami podcast, and she never mentions having a boyfriend, right? She never talks about having a boyfriend, not on her Instagram not in these interviews, never. And I'm sure that's purposeful because you don't want people to know you have a boyfriend because you're probably going to be less attractive to all of these weird OnlyFans guys who pay every month to, you know, see you naked. You'll be less attractive to them if they know you have a boyfriend, maybe. Maybe you just want to hold this appeal of being attainable. You're more attainable to these weird creepy guys if you don't have a boyfriend, if you're not taken. These guys might actually be like, hey, Courtney, Clenny, single, I have a chance with her. And that's going to keep them coming back for more. Uh, so yeah, you want to make it appear as if you don't have a boyfriend. But that would be difficult for your boyfriend, for your partner, who's constantly feeling like, what am I to you? Like, what am I in your life? What am I in your public life? You never talk about me. Nobody knows I even exist. And every day I see you, you're just posting naked pictures of yourself online. And 
And I don't know how comfortable I am with it. Like, I thought I would be comfortable with it, but then I'm in a relationship and I feel jealous and I don't like feeling jealous and insecure and I don't like this feeling and this is going to lead to fights and throwing tiger paintings out windows, maybe. I'm not judging any woman who decides to put themselves out on OnlyFans. Once again, not a choice that I personally would make, but I'm not judging you for it. Get your money, get your coin, however you need to. I don't care. I would not date you. That's all I'm saying. I wouldn't be comfortable with it because I know myself I would become like possessive and controlling and it would just drive me bananas. I'm not evolved enough, I guess. I just I can't sit here and lie to you guys and tell you that I would date somebody, man or woman, who was on OnlyFans. It would drive me crazy. It's just not in me to to do that. I don't know. And I'm sure that some people can and there's no issues, but when you see Courtney talking on like this We in Miami podcast, first of all, like I don't like <laughs> the way that men talk to OnlyFans girls. They basically treat them like pieces of meat, you know, especially on these podcasts, the Fresh and Fit podcast, like stuff like that. And I'm not saying anything about the We in Miami podcast. I think this is just their thing. I'm not negatively talking about them. I'm not saying they suck. But personally, I would not like to be spoken to that way. I would not like to be treated that way. Courtney and the other girls on there were basically treated like pieces of meat. They were asked these, in my opinion, like inappropriate questions, like questions I wouldn't want to be asked as a, as a woman, as a person. Things like, oh, like, what positions do you like? And just like really gross things. And Courtney's asked some questions and she answers them. And she says things like, um, you know, she's asked, who do you like to date? And she says something like, I only date rich black guys. And, you know, one of the hosts has her stand up and like turn around. He's like, oh, I can't even like focus with you sitting next to me right now. Like, I need you to stand up. I need to see everything. And she does a spin and stuff. Now, hold on. Can you stand up for a second? Let me see your outfit. My yeah, she got on some Catwoman pants over here. I do. Uh, distracting has me. Too. Yeah, they both do. Stand up. Let me, see, let me see your fit. All right. Ooh, Ooh look at those abs. Oh, my God. Do a little spin for oh. us. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. Look at you. Oh, look, at, look at those abs. And you know, so you know you're toxic. Yeah. I, I might have a comment now. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's very degrading, okay? Just to me. I would not like it. If I'm going on a podcast, if I'm in a room with men and women, I want us all to be treating each other like professionals, like the intelligent people that we are. Courtney Clenny may be a murderer, okay? But Courtney Clenny is a woman who made a name for herself, who made a living for herself, who made a, a crap ton of money by doing whatever she needed to do. And instead of treating her like a respectable businesswoman or respecting her for her hustle, um, she's still treated like, you know, a, a stripper at like your local dive bar. And it's just it's gross. If I'm in a room with men and women, I want us all to be treating each other like the successful professionals that we are. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I just I don't like the way that they treated her. I'm going to play some clips so you guys can see for yourself. You look like the type of girl that only dates like rich guys. Is that true? No, that's not true. I only date black guys, especially black guys, especially black guys. Let me clarify. I only date rich. OK, black guys. rich black guys. There we go. <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, you're toxic. Yeah, you can tell she like black guys, <laughs> It's like especially black guys for all you watching. I'm with it. Do you like to be fully controlled or do no. you? I like to be submissive, pretty, well, yeah, in the bedroom, yes. but like in my life, I don't like anybody to tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, so you only want them to tell you what to yeah. do in the bedroom. Other than that, you don't want them to tell you anything. Right. right. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. So that sounds like you're a control freak with your relationships. Oh, be careful with this one. Okay. She's going to boss you around like, exactly. ah, sweet just, toxicity. Tell me. So you only date rich black guys. So like, have you ever dated like any politics? So like I said, she's on this podcast just a month before this happens. And I can see how somebody who is dating her might feel some sort of way about the way that she was treated, the way that she acts, the way that she doesn't really like mention having a boyfriend. Although I will say there is a point where one of the hosts is like, oh, we're playing spin the bottle or some stupid childish shit. And like, you have to kiss me now. And she gets uncomfortable she clearly doesn't want to like kiss him on the lips and she says like no you know i'm not going to do that and she says you can like kiss me on the forehead and he's all oh yes oh yes. lord 
I didn't read this. Spin Kiss the person to your left. Whoa. <laughs> what if they're not single, though? Yeah, I gotta, can't. I gotta you gotta halt that. You gotta say where, guys. Cheek, he can kiss the cheek or her forehead. Not oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> there's some caution tape, right? <laughs> Wait, so you can't kiss my forehead? What am I, your dad? That's like a dad kiss, like That's a forehead. That's a nice thing. It's <laughs> <laughs> not bro while you're trying to kiss her he's kind of creepy about it like no shade to you guys okay creepy is your your theme it's your thing it's your aesthetic that's cool creepy guy it's your aesthetic it's just not my thing man it's not my thing i'm so sorry i feel like i'm judging but the whole fresh and fit like that whole like oh we're gonna just spend hours of a podcast like making women feel and look like pieces of me it's not my thing but it's your thing it's your niche okay it's fine <laughs> i'm judging you for it. i can't even do this i'm sure that the we in miami crew are great people i am not saying anything negative but he he did push it a little bit it made me uncomfortable and i could see how it would make courtney's partner uncomfortable to me it even made her seem a little uncomfortable so i will say that i believe she was respectful within the relationship as respectful as she could be given her line of work and given like the public persona she had to put out. But it may not have been enough for Christian. And, you know, he may have driven himself crazy thinking like, is she being unfaithful? Is there infidelity happening? There probably wasn't. She was probably telling him there wasn't. He didn't believe her. Maybe he goes out and he starts talking to other girls to make her pay for it. This is all just my speculation. Knowing what I know about relationships, knowing what I know about the dynamics between men and women, knowing what I know about how these things go this is just maybe what i think happened or possibly could have happened definitely not saying it did but i can see that there would be multiple arguments and the kinds of things i see happening in that elevator footage and in that parking lot footage where she was running and he was chasing her this to me is the sign of the what i call repetitive argument the argument that keeps popping up so you love this person you're attracted to this person. You guys get along great. But there's one thing, one linchpin, one point of contention, one or two things that keep popping up in your arguments, that keep popping up in your day to day. And you guys just can't seem to meet halfway on these issues. Now, these are issues that usually should suggest to you it's time to break up, right? Like, um, he wants kids and she doesn't. And you guys argue about this for like two years. And at the end of the two years, she still doesn't want kids. He still does. And y'all just wasted two years of your life arguing about this stupid shit for two years. Usually that's a sign when you can't meet halfway, when you can't find like a, a place where you can compromise and agree, you got to go. You got to break up with each other because you're never going to find your common ground on this issue or these one or two issues that keep coming up, the repetitive argument. But after having the repetitive argument over and over and over again, a level of frustration begins to build, a level of frustration that leads to the arguments escalating. You're no longer just shouting at each other. Now you're pushing each other and now you're slapping each other and now you're pulling at each other because this emotion that isn't being resolved from just talking because every time you talk about it you come to the same dead end and you're being frustrated and frustrated and you're trying to make this person hear you you're trying to make them hear you but just saying it isn't making them hear you and screaming at them isn't making them hear you so maybe if I like push him a little he'll hear me and and now maybe if I slap him he'll hear me it's this kind of like very toxic escalation that that occurs when these issues are are remaining unresolved. The unresolved repetitive argument that causes so much frustration, the energy that is building up spills out, it becomes physical. To me, the footage that we see of Courtney and Christian is a sign of these issues continuing to come up over and over again, never being resolved, them never finding common ground, them never meeting each other halfway, and almost knowing they'll never meet each other halfway. And this is always going to be an issue. And most likely, it always would have been an issue. And it never would. I mean, if he didn't like what she was doing with OnlyFans, what's her option? Quit? Well, she could have said to him, if I quit, who's making the money? Right? Now she's making him feel like he's making less money. That he can't provide for both of them. Now he feels like less of a man. And he feels like, you know, 
pushed down and minimized and, and it, it demasculated, emasculated, emasculated by this. And so he's like, well, I can do this and I'll make more money. And she's like, well, until you do, like, I got to keep doing this. So it's this thing that kind of keeps going around. She doesn't feel appreciated for what she's bringing to the table. She feels proud of what she's accomplished. She feels proud that she can not only, you know, provide for herself but him if he wants that and he feels like kind of diminished by that because let's be honest men feel d diminished when their partners make more money and not all men <laughs> I'm trying to generalize there's an exception to the rule but a lot of men because this has been ingrained in them throughout generations that you are the man you're the breadwinner you're the protector you need to go out there and take care of the family and take care of the woman so I think that this is just a a really big miscommunication between these two people, a sign that some of their values didn't align and probably never would have aligned. But they did care about each other and they probably were very attracted to each other. I mean, let's be honest, they're both very attractive people. I mean, between the two of them, I couldn't tell you which one's more attractive. They're both very attractive people. Uh, so they definitely probably had an attraction. They definitely probably had some sort of love, caring, um, but they just couldn't get past those issues, those linchpin issues, those repetitive, unresolved arguments. And that led to frustration and that led to physical violence and that led to Courtney doing something that I don't believe was her only option to do. So I think she definitely should you know, face prison time. I don't think it was self-defense, but that's just my opinion. There could be things that come out in trial that tell me otherwise. But wow, we talked about a lot today. We talked about a lot today. I want to just say that if there's people out there who are in these kinds of relationships, who are facing these kinds of unrepetitive, unresolved arguments over and over again, and you'll know what I'm talking about if you're going through it or you've gone through it, that one, that one stupid issue that keeps rearing its ugly head. And you're over here like, I don't understand why they don't get where I'm coming from, why they don't see my way is the best way. And they're over there thinking the same thing and nobody's going to meet halfway and it's never going to end. If you're facing these issues that continue to come up, either get some therapy so that a mental health professional can teach you guys how to handle those issues when they do arise in, in healthy ways that doesn't end in like, you know, a screaming match or a fight or, you know, just call it quits. Like call time of death and then leave the relationship because these issues will never go away. And if you guys don't feel like you can meet halfway on them and if you don't want to, you know, have a therapist to teach you how to navigate those rough waters in a way that ends with both of you being safe and dry at the other end of the argument or at the other end of the disagreement, then this is just going to it's going to go bad. It's going to be real bad. It's not going to end well ever. That's just my advice. Thank you guys so much for being here. Let me know what you think about all of this in the comments section. Um, I, I will do an update when the trial happens. Obviously, I'll, I'll be covering the trial because I'm very interested to see if some of my predictions were correct. And I feel very bad for Christian Obamselli's family. I feel very bad that this young man, this young, strong, attractive man who seemed to have a lot going for him, who seemed to be a very, very good person according to his family, who seemed to definitely have a close family who loved the hell out of him. He's no longer here, and this could have been avoided. You know, whether you want to say they should have broken up back in Austin when the police were being called, whether you want to say that Courtney could have gotten out of that situation without stabbing him, this definitely 1 million percent could have been avoided. And it's a shame, and it's a loss to the world. So uh, my thoughts and prayers with Christian's family. And we'll see what happens during the trial. Thank you guys so much for being here. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Links are in the description box. Follow my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week with retired police detective Derek Levasseur. And if you're interested in a case like this, you should go and watch the Danielle Redlick one because we did cover that, I think, in three parts. Very similar case. I'll link it in the description box if you want to just click it and check it out. They're all on YouTube now. Don't forget also to try my coffee, Criminal Coffee Company, the best coffee ever. Link is in the description box. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. And I'll see you very, very soon.
until it's getting you slowly. It's all you got to let it go. I got blood.